Hello and welcome to the Pick 6 Podcast. Sam McEwen along with Dirk Chatlin and Tom Chattel, the heavy hitters here on a Happy New Year 2023. Hello everyone. The college football season is close to coming to an end. There's one, well there's two games left in my darn opinion. The FCS Championship on Sunday with South Dakota State and North Dakota State. Good luck to anybody who roots for those teams. And then the national title game between America's team, TCU, and Max Duggan from Council Bluffs. And the Borg, Georgia Bulldogs. We'll get to those things in a moment. Uh, I want to remind people who listen to this podcast but do not subscribe to the Omaha World Herald that you can do that. Uh, go to www.omaha.com backslash subscribe. And remember that you get 26 weeks for $1. So if you go from right this moment, so with today is uh, January 5th, that's going to take you all the way through the 4th of July. That's pretty darn good, folks. It gets you all of the camps, all spring football, all of Nebraska baseball, all of the camp season for Nebraska football, which means you're getting every commit that Matt Rule gets for the 2024 class, probably some update on Dylan Rayola. It's all going to be there. Uh, one, $1, 26 weeks, sign up, www.omaha.com backslash subscribe. Um, Dirk, uh, your son will be the next uh, assistant at Nebraska. <laughs> After Nebraska hired a 24, <laughs> will hire a 24 year old to coach assistants. I think your son's 13. He's 12. He's 12. So halfway there, he'll he'll be. <laughs> oh, they're just gonna go ahead and hire him. Uh, they'll they'll have him in there. I don't know what they're gonna get. Quality control. They'll give him the quality control role uh, over <laughs> at Nebraska. This is the youngest, probably the youngest staff in 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 the Big Ten, maybe in Power Five football. Um, once Garrett McGuire joins it, it'll be 24-year-old. Rob Dvorak is under 30. Um, I think EJ Barthel is under 30, and I think Evan Cooper is right under 32. This is a young staff. Personally, as a person who likes to hire young people, I like it. I like this. But maybe not everybody agrees with that. Well, let me ask you this, Sam. What is the, what is the purpose of a $7 million assistant coach salary pool? Well, in theory, what you would argue is if you have that kind of assistant coaching salary pool, what you're going to go out and buy is what um, you're going out to buy experience. Um, and you're going out to buy n- people who... People who have multiple job offers command, yeah, from, that. From, from similar type programs. Mm-hmm. If you're hiring people who don't have that, why is the assistant salary pool as high as it is? Well, that's a good question. I think that's a reasonable question. Well, I think it's, they're going to pay their coordinators quite a bit. I think. I, I, I think it's there to, to 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 tell the head coach, hire whoever you want. If 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 you need the money, there it is. Um, right. But it's uh, <laughs> this case they probably could have used half. I mean, or less. Um, I don't know. It, you know, I was when uh, 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 Bo Pelini obviously uh, brought it. A bunch of his buddies in, and they, they, were, they weren't very. Some some were experienced, some weren't. And he and um, but it came to you know the offensive coordinator after Sean Watson. They gave it to his buddy Tim Beck, hadn't done it. Um, and same with uh, Scott Frost. I mean, they'd done it a couple of years, hadn't really done it this level. So I was like, you know, I, I don't know if this is a good idea because the head coach had never done it before and been a head coach. In this case, the head coach has done it. So I'm I'm a little more tolerant of it, but I still think I agree. I think you need this is a Big Ten, this is a big boy league, and uh, the, the coaches are all very very good um, at, at what they do, which is they scheme and they, they can coach fundamentals. So they're very hard to beat. So yeah, I think it's 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 a gamble definitely, but I can't figure out if it's is it because. I mean, are these his, his 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 like the, the buddies? Is this is this Ocean's Eleven again, or is this is this the head coach who's very confident in himself? And I can coach these guys up, and you know this is going to be good. I don't know. I, w- I want to start with this question, like for, f- before we get to whether it's a good idea or not. Like it is crazy how Nebraska head coaches just almost never bring in super high profile assistants, mm-hmm. isn't it? Yeah. Like, Frank didn't do it. No, Frank didn't. Well, he didn't. Bo didn't do it. No. Um, Callahan didn't really do it, although his were higher profile than others. Sean Watson would. 
You know, Callahan had his that, buddies. That, that had a name to it. Uh, yeah. Kevin Cosgrove was, I mean, let's be honest. Kevin Cosgrove was a big name. Riley, he didn't do a good job. Riley didn't do it. Frost he brought in his own guys. Frost right. didn't do it. Right. Like, it is crazy that with all the money and resources here, no head coach at Nebraska in 20 years. I mean, you could uh, always, well, you go all the way back to Osborne if you Sean, want to. Sean but, Eichhorst did it. Bob Diaco. Bob and, 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 and yeah, the, and, the sample size on that around, right? is is he so small that I don't know if we should judge it. Like that's that was such an odd scenario. <laughs> yeah, we're but judge because it it's terrible. It was terrible. <laughs> it was terrible. I and, and that to your point, it, it doesn't mean that it's going to work out. Like right. if you go <clears throat> right, go the the route of hiring the the best resume on the board. Uh, but it's just weird that Nebraska's never really tried to do it. Right, and I thought in this case they would try to do it. Um, because I thought the the financial resources would would sort of incentivize it, uh, encourage it, uh, and sort and rule went the other way. And you could say, okay, well, he's coaching up his coaches. He's he's an active guy. He likes to be active on the practice field. He's you know, but there are four hundred and seventy four things to do during a game week. Do you really want to be worried about what your Defensive line coach is teaching, right. and if fundamentally, if he's experienced enough to to see, has he seen Wisconsin's scheme before? Has he seen Michigan's scheme? Like, what the hell are we doing here? Mm. And and it might work, okay? Right. Like I I'm acknowledge the fact that it might work, but it just feels like an unnecessary mm. risk. Mm. Like you could hire some of these guys as assistant position coaches, right? Yeah, as I, like uh, analysts. Yes. Yeah. The guys who aren't supposed to be active on the practice field, but <laughs> yeah, quality was, control. Yes. Okay. It's a little bit of a. And the, I think I think there's some ego here too, right? That you're, I'm I, I'm a good enough head coach where I I, I, I can make these guys work. I, mean, I, I, I can I can help teach them. Uh, you know, I I I, 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 I can influence them to uh, help us and give them the way and and. Uh, it just seems unnecessary, though, Tom. I like you can be. It does, but I, but I, I I would ask you, what, uh, what I guess winning top ten, top five program has those kind of guys. I mean, I off the top of my head, I'm trying to think. Uh, does Kirby Smart hire the hot guy, the, the big name? I don't. He just lost Lanning. His, who, his who defensive he coordinator was 34 years old. Yeah, Dan Lanning was really young. Yeah, but who 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 who. who, who who did he replace him with? I don't. I don't know. Um, Other young guys. Look, I, I I have no issue with either coordinator hire. I think both coordinator hires are really good, and I think, you know, that's the most important thing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the, oh. the 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 staff guys, the assistant coaches, that's less. You know, there's less weight there, and and recruiting is a factor, and. Um, <coughs> you know, I think the fact that they're young guys means that they're more likely to connect with players and like, there's clearly positives to it. Uh, it just seems a little bit odd considering the resources available. Uh, and the fact that you probably could have got some of these guys, like I said, in different roles. Um, I, I think if there's one thing that I don't love about rule, it's that he does sort of seem like he's trying to prove that he's the smartest guy in the room. Mm. And I just – We live in an analytics world now. Look at the NFL. That's why Harbaugh did not get the job of the Vikings. They wanted to hire a, one of these hot young guys. They did. Yeah. And and uh, my Chargers, I guess they're my Chargers. Um, they did too. I, 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 I haven't quite decided yet. They, think they hired the guy on the ring who's the youngest guy. I mean, Rams defensive coordinator – What's he ever done? Yeah. So, I mean, it drives you crazy because you. I do want experience. I do like that. But that the NFL now, the trend is, you know, these young OCs. If you're a young OC, and I love all the TV guys who say, well, this guy is one of the hot young minds. And, you know, they say that about everybody. Everybody's the hot young mind, you know, brilliant young you know, coordinator. Right. Um, that's that's who's getting these jobs, and the owners and the GMs, are, especially the GMs, are now in love with analytics, and um, that's what you see now. And so, guy like Harbaugh is old school. We're trying to kick you in the pants, and and uh, he's got an attitude. He's kind of, you know, can be hard to work with. Um, 
they're not, they're not, they're not welcome anymore. So it's it's the trend, and I think it's coming in here. And um, I don't know it's, if some of these guys were really dynamic recruiters, like proven dynamic recruiters. Yeah, I think it'd be a little bit different conversation. Okay. Um, yeah, I I, I I hear you. I, I just don't know if there's a. I don't know if the recruiting track record is there to merit some of this. So the young coaches that we're talking about here are Garrett McGuire, who is 24 and a son of Joey McGuire. And, you know, again, it's possible that he's uh, coaching Wunderkind. Maybe he is. Maybe he is really that good. Um, you know, and is one of these guys that just absolutely is the superstar and has lived it and breathed it. E.J. Barthel, who I've talked to recruiting people, and they really like him. I think he's going to be a good recruiter at Nebraska. He's running backs coach. Evan Cooper, who is a recruiting and film junkie, who I think, again, gets has a pretty positive reputation around the nation. The offensive line coach is Donovan Rayola. And Rule, in an interview with Adam Carricker, eloquently explained why Rayola is the offensive line coach. He was he was raised in the system that Rule believes in. He's a pretty good recruiter. He wanted continuity. But Donovan's not old. He's only like 34, 35. The defensive line coach will be interesting. So so pot roast, as he was called in the NFL. Terrence Knighton is an interesting hire. I you know he is relatively young in in his coaching experience. He was a player for a long time, and if there's one that we probably haven't covered too much in depth, it would be that one. And a lot of times that position is is manned by an older guy uh, who's who's kind of like your your second coordinator. In this case, I don't think that's going to be true. I think your second coordinator <laughs> could be Matt Rule, um, and then Tony White, who I think is a good hire. Um, I have, of all the hires that have been made, I think my question mark may be the co- offensive coordinator. Like I, I think that Matt Rule will have a heavy hand there, and he wanted somebody who was going to come in and do what he wanted to do, um, but he's had an up and down record. Right. Special teams coordinator is older. The uh, the tight ends coach is from Texas. He's in his fifties, but he's never coached in collegiate level. Um, but then Joey McGuire hadn't done it either, and look how well that turned out. So I, you know, I, I like. Mm. I think one thing I'll say about hiring young guys is there's a pretty darn good chance that a young coach is going to have, and I there's no other way to put this, more free time. They've probably learned less and have different, very, you know, they're, they're probably not quite set in their philosophies. A couple of years ago, Nebraska was pursuing a defensive line coach who had an incredible track record. Who was this? This was Riley. Um, Riley didn't hire him. He, he hired Perella. But he had an incredible track record, and ultimately he just did not agree with what Nebraska was doing. Um. So you can have a great name that doesn't fit, Bob Diaco being an example. Um, so younger coaches aren't set in their ways. They're more likely to be grinders. And I think on some level, Matt's, Matt Rule looks back at his own experience and says, you know, there were things that were true of me when I was 28 or 29 years old, and I was a pretty damn good coach back then, and I'm going to hire a version of myself. Yeah. <clears throat> I Don't get you it. Think some of that to that? I get like it. If, you were, if, if I asked you, Dirk, to hire – a version, uh, uh, you know, uh, a feature writer, a feature columnist, the way yeah, it's, what you do. It's funny. Who would you hire? Well, well, I don't know. Would you hire some? Well, it's an it's, exa- it's a, Well, I'll use myself, an exa- I'll use myself as an example. I was probably more energetic, hungrier, more creative, all those things at age 30 than I am at age 40. Okay. okay. So to your point, like there are, there are advantages. Only 40? I think I'm 41. Oh, yeah. Stop it. Stop all, all um, of you. No, and, and to be honest, like I so was you're six years uh, younger than Matt. Rule. There are parts of there. There are parts of me that were better at thirty than there are at forty. There are parts of me that are better at forty than I was at thirty. Uh, you would. Con- now, I'm going to ask a personal question. Oh you, boy, would you consider your best work to be 24th in glory? Yes, that was between 35 and 40. Okay, yes. So okay. that wasn't done when you were 29. No, that was done. Most no, and there were you know there's, I was um, like I said I was. There, there were parts of me that were better when I was young. There are parts of me that are better than I'm old. I would just hope that Matt Rule could find both. Like, right. you know, like, this is Nebraska, man. You got $7 million in your salary pool. Go out and find the best candidate. Right. You know, like, you might believe in a guy, 
That's okay to believe in a guy. Make him go prove it at Central Michigan before right. he proves it at Nebraska. Right. That's. I guess that would be my point. That's fair. That's. I mean, I think that's very fair. And just again, seven ten thousand foot view of assessment of your work, I would say that the last six years have been a, a building of oh, and on the first ten years, and like you've done incredible work in the last six years that you probably couldn't have done when you were twenty five. No, but I was a better I was a better Nebraska football writer when I was twenty nine. Right. I understand. Uh, and part of that was because Nebraska was a better program and they were more interesting. Um, but yeah, it's it's a really, and I, I'm sure everybody could could look at this through their own industry, you know, whether it's insurance sales or accounting or whatever. Um, I just, we're talking about, you know, hopefully a top 20 program in college football here. Uh, and they're hiring guys, <clears throat> frankly, as if they are a bottom 10 job in the FBS or, or certainly in the Power Five. They won't so. leave. They're less likely to leave. They're yeah. not Corey Raymond. Now, for people who don't remember who Corey Raymond was, Corey Raymond's a hell of a defensive backs coach who I really liked. Like, of all the assistants Nebraska's had since I started covering this, Raymond's very close to the top. Like, he was funny. He was smart. He's now at LSU still, I think. Yeah. Um, but Corey was here for one year. Trivia, <laughs> trivia question, Sam. Uh, I, and I'm not going to put you on the spot because yeah. it's too difficult. But I wonder if you could name every defensive backs coach at Nebraska in the last 20 years. <laughs> and how long it would take you to do it. Because, oh my gosh, there's been so many. It wouldn't take that long. <laughs> i got to be honest with you. Okay. I mean, I'm, you I'm go not, back to I'm, 07, I'm not going to make you do it. You Raymond, asked the wrong person. Yeah, yeah. Elmatian, Sanders, Raymond, Joseph, Warren. Uh, See, Warren's probably the one that I, I would have forgot. Warren, um, <laughs> Brian. God, what was the guy's name? Brian. He went to the Cowboys. Yeah. The late, the late uh, passed away. Iowa. It's it's Elliot. A, it's Bob, a, Bob Elliot. Elliot. It's a it's a crazy question. Dante, anyway, Dante Williams, Travis Fisher, and now Evan Cooper. Yeah. Well, there you go. Look at that. Um, um we've got we've got availability with the two coordinators. We, we've got we've got breaking news. Um, the um, but you know, and I do agree, Brick, but I just wonder. This isn't a top twenty job, and it, it, it's a project. They're paying like it is. Well, everybody's got money now. I mean, it's it's. Um, we don't know how many guys turned it down. Like I don't want to go there. Every four years, they get a new coach, and that's too hard. And I, I mean, it's. I don't know. We just don't know. So, but I think in this case, I I I think I think Matt will clearly. Sees a chance, so I, I can, you know, I'll, I'll, you're right, the smartest guy in the room thing. Um, but I give him a little bit of a, actually, I do give him a pass because he's done it. Yeah, I agree. And so, because he's done it, and and he's, his coordinators are, are guys that have been around. Um, the, the Notre Dame guys, the Notre Dame, uh, Syracuse, Tony White. One of the hot guys. Yeah, he, no, I, he was a hot guy. I, there are clearly positives to this, and I don't want to come across as super critical. I just think we need to be skeptical of it. Um, Absolutely. And you know, it's if it wasn't the Big Ten, Tom, I know, where I know. In a, in, and granted, like, I know. W did Wisconsin's offensive coordinator shine? No. Did Brian Ferentz shine? Those guys have experience. They're not good at their jobs right now, so I get it. Right? Wisconsin's a good comparison. Experience. Though, so. They went out and hired North Carolina's offensive yeah. coordinator. That's a that's a big time hire, that, and, and I'm not saying it's going to work. I'm saying they went out and hired the guy that just coached Drake May, and everybody's going. Oh, okay. But the, but, but that's, the a, big, that's the thing. The Big Ten. Programs aren't good. The cultures aren't good because of the, the coordinators. It's the head coach. But why did Wisconsin that do stuff? that? Hmm? They did that for a reason. They could have just hired Joe Schmo to come in and run the same too tight fullback offense. They did it for a reason. Right. But they think that's the difference. That guy. Right. But I'm saying that the, if you're looking, I agree if with you're looking you. at why the Big Ten is so hard, it's the head coaches sure. uh, and ads and all that stuff. But they, they that's what they. And then they bring in coordinators, and then they either work or they don't. Sure. I mean, uh, Michigan had uh, the, the the old old guy Don Brown for a while. And that didn't that didn't get him over the hump. It didn't get him over the hump. They fired him. They've now brought in two coordinators from a row from John Harbaugh, you know, from the Ravens. So Ohio State, for example, Ohio State fired Kerry Kerry Coombs, 
and they brought in Jim Knowles, and you know, and they they paid they paid Jim Knowles like two million dollars. They're ready to fire him after the after, after the Michigan <laughs> game. Well, I know there, because they, they, they know. gave up all those big plays. There's clearly he was part of this. Michigan. There, there's there's two very different philosophies here, and you'll see them on display at different programs in college football. One is go hire the best guy on the board, and he comes in and he does his job. And whether he believes in the overall product of the program or not, or the vision. He's going to do his job because he's got a track record and he's going to keep doing it. The other one, and and to me this is maybe the most compelling part of the rule thing, is these guys that are coming in here, they're probably going to run through a wall for rule in the same way that players would. That's right. Because they didn't, they weren't going to get this opportunity anywhere else. Right. So to me, that's maybe the most interesting part is like, you know, the McGuire kid coming in. <laughs> I mean, what is he not going to do for Matt Rule? That's because right, right. Uh, and, 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 where else is he going? And where else was who else was going to give him this opportunity? Right. Uh, so I think the fact that the head coach will have so much sort of a mentorship role over his non-coordinators. I think the coordinators are sort of exceptions to the rule here. Um, no pun intended. Yeah, but I like that. But uh, wow. But, but everything I've heard though is, is I think that's right. The um, these guys push it. Matt Rule is going to push it. He pushes players hard. He's already pushing them hard. And uh, the staff gets pushed. They, they also push. Everything is is just nonstop. So maybe that's part of that. And uh, when you really believe in your boss, you know, I think that matters. Yeah. Are we in a moment in society where we're getting fatigued by the smartest guy in the room thing, though? Oh, Look, Okay, so, so, to, so to be clear, even if I – I think that Matt Rule is a smart guy. I think he does have a little bit of a disruptive personality, not disruptive as a personal behavior, but I'm like we're going to do things a little bit differently because we're going to we're going to do it and we're going to do it this way, the money ball thing. Is he a contrarian? Uh, I don't know, but he is a guy that's like when we if we win the if we win the the coin flip, we're going to defer every time. There's no choice. Like he does he defers every time. Uh, if we, you know, we're going to do this, this, and like he has a, he has a, a philosophy. Yeah, I'm okay with most of that. Uh, to be clear, but I'm, when you say, you know, he sometimes he can be the smartest guy in the room, that wouldn't make him uh, dissimilar from almost all college Correct. coaches at this moment, or, including or, some or, of these wunderkinds in the NFL or any coaches anywhere for that sure. matter. Sure, but my question to you is. Are we getting just a society? Are we getting fatigued with that idea that like there's always a new way to do it, or there's always like mm. there's always some sort of you know schematic spin that can be put on it? Are we getting tired of people being the smartest people in the room? And sometimes do we overrate intelligence? I don't think we do because it keeps happening. It keep you know, no, I don't think it's. Uh, it, I don't think. I mean, are we tired of it? I don't know. I can't speak for everybody. But I'm, I've been tired of it for a while, but. Uh, I, I don't think Matt Rule has been brought here to be the smartest guy. He's been here to he, – he's, he's got to build a program. He's got to recruit, and he's got to set up – you know, he's, he's got to set up practices so they're, they are – when they get on the field during games, they don't make mistakes. Hmm. And they, they, they beat the other guy in, the, in the, the trenches, and they score touchdowns and win games. That's what he's here for, right. not to outsmart everybody. Um, the last guy – Thought he could outsmart everybody, and uh, yes, that worked I out. think that's accurate. I how think he had out. he's so, yeah. he, and he is a very smart person. Right, Scott's very smart, but that's not about it didn't work. <laughs> the Big Ten isn't about being smart; it's about being efficient. It's about being physical. Mm -hmm. That's smart. That's what smart is. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I think Rule understands that part of it. Yeah, um, I I, I, I just think there's I a agree. piece of him that. I don't know, thinks that he's kind of figured something out that others haven't. Sure. And I think that's, uh, I think that can be a little bit of a dangerous philosophy. I, I, don't I, you think Fred, Fred Hoiberg came here with that a little bit? Yeah. Like, I'm just going to run back what I did at Iowa State because I get to shop for the groceries at Nebraska as opposed to the Bulls. Yep. And man, was he wrong. Like, he, and he's mm -hmm. humbled. I mean, I think he's changed. He's changed, I think. But. You got to do research on and this. We kind of run man. into that, and well, didn't wasn't that Scott's story? And we're going to come in here. We're going to do this. This we're going to break. We're going to break shit up. And, and what that ended was, up happening is Nebraska got broken. That was my story when I came into the Big Ten. I never respected the Big Ten. I, right. 
I still don't like it. Well, Tom, I would say, though, that the Big Ten has changed a lot because I think your original <clears throat> skepticism and criticism was, was right. <laughs> I think the Big Ten used to be kind it's of a still, roll your eyes league. It's still boring. It still doesn't win national championships. That's not, not nearly enough. It doesn't right. play for them. Right. It doesn't have the attitude of we're going to go all in. Yeah. Um, uh, it has more of that. But it's a, better, it's a better league than yeah. it was it's 15 league, years ago. But um, – and you know why it's a better league? Because the coaches are better. Or Meyer. But I'm saying I, I did not. I did not respect. I, the I don't like that person. Football. But I know. without him, right. the league does not update itself. Right. It did. It. But it, it became didn't. a meaner and and tougher league that recruited more cutthroat because he entered it. If he doesn't go and take that job, is Michigan what it is? I don't think so. But it's still. That's dumb. And Ohio right. State has slipped since he left. Yeah. But the overall effect of the Big Ten still isn't great. Second best league. It's pretty yeah, good. I guess. I mean. It's going to get more interesting in two years. I know that. I, oh, yeah. It's better, but it's still, I feel like it's still, it's still got a ways to go. If well, Michigan and Ohio State had won those games, would your opinion be different? Well, yeah, it would. Probably. But what else could have Ohio State done? They played uh, as good as they could have played. I just I see Minnesota with a ceiling. I see sure. Purdue with a oh, ceiling. Yeah. I see these. They're you know what I mean. I do. They're good. They're not absolutely. great. Absolutely. So that, that, that if, absolutely. If Urban Meyer he, he didn't lift up everybody. Yeah, I get it. But I get it. Here, yeah. here, here's a question for you, Sam. And I agree with your take on Urban Meyer and his effect on the league. Uh, the next question would be: Will USC affect the Big Ten as much as Urban Meyer did? No. No, no really? No. Not that they play not playing defense. No way. Mm-mm. I don't know. No. They're going to be in for a, a rude awakening, I think, in some some games because they right. don't play defense yet. Right. I'm not saying that USC is going to dominate the league the way Urban Meyer did. That's not no. what I'm saying. No. But I think the influence in terms of like, okay, we are a national conference. Yeah, now. true. Yeah, absolutely. I there. think that. Mm-hmm. I think the end of divisions will be the will be one of the largest influences. As I watch the college football playoff games, we can transition yeah. to this now. One of the things that, and I had talked to another reporter. Uh, at Creighton Women's Basketball Media Availability about what what I thought would happen in the <laughs> Michigan TCU game. And I said, you know, Michigan played rotten offenses almost all season long, with the exception of Ohio State. This league's offenses suck. And it sucks in part because of the Big Ten West, because what you're incentivized to do right. is not play offense in the Big Ten West. And to be clear, Michigan should have won that game. They're the better team. They didn't win the game because they gave up two defensive touchdowns, and I would love to know the odds on any team winning a game after they give up two defensive touchdowns. And it's blowing a fourth and one at the one-yard line. If it were a fourth and one. Fourth and goal at the one. It was whatever. a first and goal. Yeah. Oh, my God. They ran that stupid play on first and goal, Yeah. which is shocking to me. Yeah. There's no reason to run it on first and goal. Anyway, um, what I would say is that, you know, Michigan got an awareness of, oh, this is what happens when you blitz seven guys and the quarterback is good. We didn't we didn't know that that could happen. Tommy DeVito didn't do that to us. Kate, <laughs> Kate, you know, Shubba Purdy wasn't able to do that. You know, I mean, that's what happened in that, the game. That is a fantastic analysis. I love you it. You know, I mean, Max made two great plays in that game, and he didn't make a ton of them, but he made two great ones. And both times he rolled right, and he had a shallow crosser because the air raid has that a lot. He hits a shallow crosser twice, pull touchdowns. One short, one long. But that's a play. I mean, Michigan blitzed on both plays. Seven guys. Oh, we're going to get there. No, you're not because you're facing a real offense. And so there were a lot of reasons why Michigan lost. That was the game that was going to be less interesting to me. But as it turned out, it was far more interesting because when I watched the second game, I'm like, there's nothing Ohio State could have done. They don't have as good of football players as Georgia. They played 14 points above their head, and they lost because – you know, at the end of the game, maybe they could have hit one more pass and given that kid a 40-yard field goal. But Ohio State played about as good as it could play. They've just fallen that far on defense. And it's because Urban Meyer's not there anymore to recruit the jerks that they used to have. Jerks is a wrong word, but <laughs> they, the don't edge, have a, they don't the have edge. a Bosa. They don't, I'm serious. <laughs> you go back, just go back and look at the 2016 defense that Nebraska faced when they went out there and lost 62-3. to And... There were four guys in the Ohio State secondary. They were all first-round draft picks. 
and they had a Bosa. Like it was crazy. <laughs> they so, they didn't have that. They they don't have a first round draft pick on that team. And so as I watched that game, I I actually found myself rooting for Ohio State because I'm like, this team is coaching and playing its guts out, and they deserve to win. And they fell short because they don't have the players. And that's an amazing statement. The Michigan though, <clears throat> you're like. I can't believe that Michigan even has a chance to win this game, and they did. And they Isn't just, it true, based on your analysis, that Georgia would have beat Michigan by 21 points? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, and I don't think I would have said that two weeks ago. And I'm the one who said that Ohio State could win that game because of the quarterback and the receivers. Well, one of those receivers gets hurt in the third quarter. That was a huge play. If he doesn't get hurt, then I think they probably win the game because they have the players. But, I mean, my goodness, C.J. Stroud just basically... Right. Put himself, he made himself millions of dollars. He played great, but again, you could go back. I've watched that game actually again. There's, there's virtually nothing Ohio State could have done. I mean, Georgia's just that good across the board. And to come within one point of that team in that setting, which is a road game, oh, my God. That, yeah, the, I was impressed. The big play was the, 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 the long touchdown pass. They were, they were down 14 or 17 uh, and you know it was getting late, and they had to have a play, and they made a play. And, uh, you know, Ohio State was a Stetson man. Bennett. I mean, I, the guy stepped up, but uh, he's older than half the NFL quarterback. He's well, older than Garrett McGuire. Well, maybe he should coach at Nebraska. He is. I think he's he is. Casey Thompson man. is. Um, yeah, I know. <laughs> but I'll get Michigan. If all they do is just go Big Ten boring, they'll probably win that game. But Harbaugh started to get too fancy. Yeah, that's about the smartest guy in the room. Uh, thing yeah. just you're on the one yard line oh we got yeah. screwed on the oh. touchdown no you did you're yeah. one you have yard line you have that offensive line and you know so um the game turned when michigan was like okay you're gonna bring six guys and put them into this tiny compressed space we're gonna start running the quarterback but, and that's yeah. when the game kind of shifted she's like oh, oh this guy can actually run now he's allowed to run but, and I, that would that if they'd done that the whole game i think tc would have had a real I, problem i think last, i think last week was a, a good lesson for this monday and that is yeah we this, this one will be a blowout georgia will blow out ohio state all of those teams belong in that level right there's, or, there's a certain i don't know how many teams there are but they all belong at the top and they can all beat each other under the right circumstances. Do you give all, TCU a chance? They all belong. Absolutely, because of what I'm just saying. Yeah. You, they, 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 they belong. They, you know, they shouldn't get blown up. Uh, uh, but Georgia's got more. But sometimes, you know, if, if they get up to a good start, if something good happens to them early, then there'll be a little atmosphere, right. something, something in the air in that stadium. Everybody will be starting to pull for TCU oh, a little, little harder, a little harder. And so America's so, so, sometimes things happen. And, uh, yeah. I mean, I, that's what I saw at uh, Miami, Nebraska, eight, however many years Let ago. Let me give you a that's big a difference, a though, point. a yeah. huge difference. And it's, I'm so glad you pointed that out because I think this is one of the big themes in college football that I haven't articulated very well and I haven't seen other people write about very much. These games are so freaking long. Yeah. There are so many plays. It's like an NBA. Okay, there's a saying in the <laughs> NBA, everybody in the NBA makes a run, and you're never too far behind to come back and win. The Toronto Raptors, were they scored 28 points in the last three and a half minutes last night. Right. 28 points oh, in the last the three and a half I minutes. Know, know. They were down by like 19 points with yeah. three minutes left, and they sent it to overtime. Yeah. There's always enough time in the NBA, and it feels like college football is becoming like that. Where it's like these games are so long, there's so many plays, so many drives, the clock stops so often, so many big plays, that inevitably the more talented team is going to is going to find a way. And of course there's ex- exceptions, right? Of course there's exceptions. But I think it's harder to pull off upsets than it used to be because you can't milk clock. You can't have a drive that takes – Half of the second quarter, right. like it's just the the better team always has enough opportunities to make plays, right. and and I think Georgia proved it. Um, I think, frankly, Michigan should have proved it, but I I'm not so sure that TCU well, they gave up two defensive touchdowns. Yeah, but there's so many that. possessions now. Yeah, that I just think it's harder to pull off upsets. If you go back and watch the Miami Nebraska game in the Orange Bowl in 1984, that game went by fast. Yeah. I mean, it really did. I haven't counted possessions. I'm guessing there's probably 
11 possessions in that game on each side. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How many possessions were there in the Ohio State-Georgia game on Saturday? Tons. Michigan and Michigan 15? And TCU, there were more. 17? Yeah. I mean, lot. and I think, Sam, you've written about this in the past. Like, they got to find a way to make the clock move. Like, the game. No question. It's just there would be more unpredictability, more volatility, more upsets if if games went faster. It would. Um and a big part of that, I think, would just be have the clock run after first downs, you know, like the NFL. Um, yep. But I think that's a huge factor in why you see the the consistent dominance from the same programs, Alabama, Georgia, Ohio State. Yeah. There's just too many possessions in games. Kansas State played about as good of a 29 minutes of football against Alabama as you could. I mean, they really did. They played really well, coached well, schemed well. And then fourth down, they had a single man route, doesn't hit it, and then from there, okay, so that play doesn't hit, and they're I think they were down ten seven, right? And from there, it just fell out, it fell apart, and you notice the pressure that Alabama put on Kansas State just by doing nothing at all. Kansas State calls a timeout, and then Alabama scores a touchdown, and then to start the second half, Kansas State feels like they have to try an onside kick. It would have worked if one guy hadn't paid attention, but he did. Then Alabama scores, and the game's over. And I think that's the same challenge that TCU has Monday with Georgia. They have to play just about close to perfect, and if they do, they might have a chance. I have one more question on the CFP stuff before we move to basketball. Do you, do you begrudge Alabama and Georgia their success? I don't. Like, I don't really have a problem. Why? With I don't really have a problem with no. it. No. You know what I mean? Like, somehow, sometimes you can – you can watch a franchise or a sports team, and you can be like, I'm really tired of this team winning. They don't really deserve it. Oh, I feel that way about Alabama. Come on. Why? Because they don't really do, they don't really do anything wrong, though. Like, they're not. I, re- I respect it. Of course I respect it. But good God, it gets old. The likable as heck. I mean, yeah, he's a really good kid. You get kid. tired of it, but it's not because of the, the, uh, the, they do deserve it. They, they keep doing it. Yeah. But yeah. you get tired of it. I think one thing that has annoyed me about Alabama is they seem to get they seem to get a lot of breaks late in the season. Sure, um, you know they've they've finagled their way into national championship games and playoffs when it very True. easily could have gone the other way. Seventeen is a good example. I mean, it's like to, to not to win the national championship without winning your division. Yeah. I think is what's the is an eye roller. Uh, what's the um, I'm anxious to see the the 12 team and uh, if what you say is true that the the best teams will always win that 12 team that's going to be interesting i think my theory is the more that you expand it in football the more likely it is that the best team will emerge and my my argument for that is when we didn't have any championship game at all is right. when we had the most variety in right. national champions like colorado and georgia tech are never winning a national championship ever again <laughs> Ever. Well, 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 Washington's well, never winning one. Well, BYU, well, well, that's because, forget about it. No, it's not happening. Well, Colorado shouldn't have won that one, but anyway, that's a whole other story. You're, I'm not going to argue with you there. <laughs> I remember waking up. No, the, I, I remember that when they won that game and waking up the next day and being mad that they won a national title before Nebraska did in my lifetime. I, I, I just, yeah. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm just, I can't wait to find out because when you do have to play, sometimes a lot of those schools show up and, okay, we've won the game because we're Alabama. Mm-hmm. But... I mean, the you, variability. You have to do that, and they right. and, and and some other team gets on a roll. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. they they've won a couple of playoff games, and here we come. I'm 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 I'm, I'm going to be anxious to find out. And, I hope um, I hope you're right. And uh, I'll tell you one thing: um, the Rose Bowl and the Cotton Bowl this year would have been playoff games, and would, that would have been um, fun, a lot more fun than having to have all these bowl games after the playoff games on Saturday. Lowest rated. Uh, Rose Bowl ever, pretty much, and the Cotton Bowl only had four million yeah, viewers. Just, it's it's hard to sell Penn State vanilla versus Utah vanilla, and um, even in that in in the, at that uh, incredible venue, um, but be making a playoff game, something's at stake. Okay, yeah, that's the problem with the Rose Bowl is <laughs> in that scenario. It's just how do you how do you sell its importance? Like yes. Penn State might have been. And granted, they won the game. They played well, like yada yada. But like, they had the most forgettable twelve game season of any top ten team 
I can remember. Mm-hmm. Like, it was boring. Yep. Lost yeah. badly to the two best teams. And then, it's and not, then they eked out some. They eked out a win against Purdue, and that was their season. It's it's important to the people in the game, but it's not important. It's it's now, if cool. Nebraska were there, we would have made it's a big traditional. Deal. It's cool, you know, yeah. but the playoff games are now taking over. And when there's eleven playoff games, you're damn right they're going to take over. Matt and, Rule better make one of those in the next five years, right? Well. Five years? Oh, what, mm. a, what an expectation! I'll bet Matt Rule expects to make. They got to be. Years. Well, they, they got to be where the uh, uh, Penn State was. Uh, yeah, that's where they got to be. Got to be top three. That's right. All right, let's move to basketball real quick. Nebraska's eight and seven overall. Um, they beat Iowa last week, and uh, incidentally, the lowest uh, effective field goal percentage in the Fred Hoiberg era uh, for the opponent was last week. So it's probably the best defensive game that Nebraska's ever played under Fred. And then they went to Michigan State, and they did what Nebraska usually does at Michigan State. They laid an egg. And now they have what I would consider, and I'm not just saying for this for the podcast, the two most important games of their season. Add a bad team. Minnesota. And, and add a team and, and, and at home against a team that is not nearly as good as their name and their whatever. Which yeah, Illinois. 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 Right. Two biggest games of the year because I think Nebraska can win both of them. Boy, Sam, if they win both, I think the NIT watch begins. Um, and maybe that doesn't sound like a big deal, but it sure would be a big deal to Fred Hoiberg. I, uh, I'm skeptical that, th- that they can win both, but but I do think I think the Michigan State loss was sort of inevitable. Like There's certain games on your schedule that just – you look at them and you're like, well, okay, what's what's the other team doing right now? What's the what's Nebraska doing? Like it just on paper, it looked like a tough game. Uh, Nebraska was in it for a while, and then they, you know, it, they, it got away from them. But but I think that uh, I think you're right that Saturday in particular, I think, is huge for Nebraska. Uh, they're not going to have many road opportunities in the Big Ten. This is one they got to get. Minnesota is is the worst team in the league. You got to find a way to win up there. Illinois is one of the most baffling teams in college basketball, and I'm not kidding. You look at, just look at their head coach; he looks like he's, he's just out of his mind because he doesn't know what the hell they're doing. This or, is a team why it's happening that has beaten UCLA, and UCLA has come, come down a little bit, and Texas before Chris Beard's arrest. Well, Texas when when they had Beard was great, right? That's a great win. Um, since then, si- since December 10th, um, they don't have a win over a power conference team. Here are, their, here are their games against power conference teams. A 74-59 loss to Penn State, a, a 93-71 loss to Missouri, and a 73-60 to loss to Northwestern. Their wins in that time were over Bethune-Cookman and Alabama A&M. This team isn't very good. This is the game. Now, see, I would say that the bigger game is Illinois. You can't let a team like that, just like Iowa, come in that isn't is a bad version of Illinois and come in and beat you in your home court. That's well, a huge game. At, they're all, but at this point, they're all big for them because sure. they've got to win as many as they can, and they can't take any nights off. Uh, but, yeah, you're right. They, um, it's a chance to – I mean, that's another one of these name wins. Creighton, Iowa, Illinois. Uh, you get them into your home – and you know you 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 know Creighton was off that uh, certainly there was something was going on in the program. Um, Nebraska seized on it and they won. Uh, they took advantage of it. Iowa, same thing. Something was Clearly going on in the Iowa program. With Iowa right yeah. Now. yeah, and they're and, in trouble. Yeah, so uh, Nebraska took advantage of it, and 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 that's what they've got. Illinois is coming in here with 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 uh, problems, confidence issues. That that's one you should. But the Minnesota one, <laughs> that's almost like. You can't expect Nebraska to be the favorite and win this. Well, they better win this game or else. It's still too much to ask, I think. But the, the Minnesota just, will find a way to win that game. And no, they probably him. will. That's a goof. <laughs> you know, and I think it was Lee B. who told me this way back in the day. That's yeah. a goofy arena. Yeah. You you may you it may shoot goofy. great there, yeah. and you may shoot like you've you've never shot a basketball before. You they just ha- don't know. They, they have to shoot well. Obviously, they're going to play defense every game. Uh, it, the, if they win, it's because they, they made some shots. And the problem is in the Big Ten, everybody plays defense against you too. So, right. um, 
It's, but at least we're talking about this. It's a fascinating thing. It's 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 interesting. Nebraska basketball is interesting. And um, yeah, Minnesota hung with Wisconsin the other night. I mean, they're not. Oh, Wisconsin sucks. It was at Wisconsin. That's another one they can win at home. You better believe it. Oh, well, they can My win. God, they How can win a lot of home games. Winning. Nebraska's got to find. It. They got to find Chucky. a way to win. Got to find a way He's to a win. He's a big reason why, but my, I'm like, hoop. I watch Wisconsin. I'm like, how, how do you do it? <clears throat> what deal did you make? <laughs> it's Wisconsin. How do you keep winning all these Big it's Ten titles Wisconsin. playing the way that you play, beating these teams by four and three, and then coming and you know, and, and then everything's on the line, and Nebraska's worst team ever comes in and beats you. Like, that's the day that they regress to the mean. Like, I, it's amazing to me how much success Wisconsin basketball has. The football program, I kind of get, and the football programs also come down to earth. That basketball team just keeps winning. You know, like their their coach is buttered toast. I mean, he's boring. <laughs> they don't have like elite recruits. The best players leave. Marquette's probably better. They just find a way to win in the Big Ten. I don't know how they do it. Well, I uh, I sure wish Nebraska had their point guard. <laughs> me too. Yeah. I mean, the to me, the biggest what if. And granted, there's a lot of them right now. But, man, if you took Nebraska's roster exactly as it is right now and you put Chucky Hepburn on it, whew. Oh, I know. Because then Sam Griesel could do something else. Yes. Which he needs. Like, he's so unselfish that at some point, you know, you figure Fred's going to come over to Sam. Come here. Shoot shoot the ball. You got to score. Like, I, I know, but he's not a great scorer, Sam. I, but he's so many possessions will go down the floor, and I'm like, he needs to just try to score. Because you know what, Nebraska's got some pretty good, you know, garbage rebounders. Yeah, they I, they can get second chance points. What they what they struggle to do is hit threes. I actually think Nebraska's the biggest concern that I have for Nebraska basketball is that over the rest of the season is that it just becomes such a grind that their defense goes back to average. Right. You know, like their defense has to be the level that it was against Iowa and every Purdue. home game. Yeah. Every home game. Right. You're going to lose a couple just because opponents hit shots and they're more talented. But, man, you can't become – they got eight home games left. They can't go four and four at home. They can't. They got to go six and two, seven and Agreed. one. And in order to do that, the defense has to stay exactly where it is. And that's hard to do when you play a Big Ten game every three days. That's right. And you get behind early and then you just lose that juice because you know you can't keep up. And, you know. and then I think um, – after a season, you sell this uh, style to uh, transfers and recruits. You keep the style. You got to find a couple scores out there. You know, add somebody who can actually score to this kind of team for next year. And they're going to lose some guys. Obviously, they're going to have to have to bring some in. But um, I think I think he's, he's finally hit on the right thing. But you got to add the offense too. Yeah, it's hard because I'm. First of all, I don't, I don't anticipate. I don't think you're any different. We don't anticipate a coaching change. No, I don't. Uh, think. I, and I, and I, who I knows, bad, right? Like, there's he's still bad. two months to go, and it could go south. But yeah. we don't anticipate a coaching change. But we do anticipate a huge roster overhaul again, because I don't know how many of these guys are going to come back. You know, right? And so you basically have to That's take the template that you discovered, and try to find four new guys who can fit that's, the template. That's where he is right now. He has not built the program up to be a high school um, players, but at least you found the template. Right. By God, I'll, I'll, I'll take it. By year four, I'll take it. You found something that works. Should have done it in year two, well, but, damn it, but it is what it is. didn't because we all underestimate the big time. And on that, I think we will end our Pick 6 podcast for this week. We will be back next week to talk about the two big games that I think will d help determine Nebraska's basketball season. Uh, we're going to hear from the offensive coordinator, Marcus Satterfield, and the defensive coordinator, Tony White, on Friday. And then I think we're going to hear from more assistants next week. Uh, so we'll have more to talk about there. And maybe we'll hear from Matt Rule. You never know. All right. For Tom, for Dirk, I'm Sam. Thanks for listening to the Pick 6 podcast. Mm -hmm.